Hey Grand School, what's up? This is Characters, how's it going? Um, back with the cartoon, back with Wacka Fish. This is episode number five, I believe, and the last one of the series. I'm here with my student Joe. Do you want to say hello? What's up, guys? And yeah, sad days today because me and Joe are going to wrap up this series. Not because it's not been great and we haven't enjoyed it. It's been really good, and I think you guys have enjoyed it too, at least I hope so. Um, but we're going to move on, or I'm going to move on at least to other things and different topics and plenty of new content coming up for you guys. So um, yeah, stay tuned for that. Today, Joe, um, what are we going to talk about? We're going to talk about a bit just now about what we're going to do against... There's obviously different varieties of fish, and one of those fish, I think it's the pink one here in this cartoon, actually. That's my colour for the, the spaz fish, as I call it, the one that's sort of flipping out, being really aggressive, being really aggro. These guys are a common feature on Pokestars New Jersey as well, right, as a subtype of fish. Um, yeah, I mean, but this guy kind of stood out like a sore thumb, though. I mean, uh, I don't see them. I mean, this guy's an eighty-seven seventy-four. Wow. <laughs> so, uh, so I, you know, I see a lot of fish and some aggro fish, but this one really stood out. So that's. Yep. So this is one I would actually give the whale tag to. It's yeah. A specific tag that's reserved for only the kind of fish that you would actually like follow around the lobby because they're so bad that you'd give up tables just to be sat with the chance of getting in a pot with them. Move yeah. up to like 1000 NL and play against these guys, kind of thing. Maybe not. Back row management's important. Don't play 1000 NL. But <laughs> within reason, you can definitely like seek these guys out because they are that bad. So, you played a session recently with one such fish. What did you sort of notice that you had to change in your game? What were your kind of adjustments? What was your game plan? Well, you know, I was adjusting on the fly and. Um, the, the, what I noticed right away, I mean, this guy's playing a ton of hands. I mean, he's on table. I don't know. Are you seeing the tables now? So he's on table one. I've not got your screen going just yet because we're in discussion mode. But I'm going oh, to actually, okay. I'm going to switch to your screen. Now. Yeah. What um, I mean, my default here was to you know let this guy fire at okay. me. Then I'm just going to call down with premium hands. So we're know, talking about that, Harley O six here, just to clarify for the audience. We yeah. got this eighty seven seventy four purple stats here. This is the guy. Right. Um, so, sorry. What, no, like, that's right. Yeah, three bed of 63. Yep. You know, and it's over, I mean, a small sample, but it's 47 hands. It's not like it's over 10 hands. Wow. So, I mean, three bed of 63. That's probably like the biggest three bed I've ever seen over like more than 20 hands. That's yeah, pretty exactly. crazy, yeah. But the funny thing is actually, uh, in retrospect, when I went back and studied the video and looked at it more, actually post-flop, he's not nearly as aggressive. These are pre-flop because you look at his seabed, it's only 29. Yeah, uh, and then his uh, aggression factor on, in the middle line is uh, after the V pip and PFR is mm. only one point seven. So that's actually a pretty low aggression factor. So I mean, in game I was playing, but realistically, this guy is very, very aggro pre flop. Post flop, he slows down. Now I didn't exactly make that. I I, I wasn't aware enough to make a strong enough adjustment then, but in looking at this now, and if mm. I was to play this guy again, I, I would certainly make note of that. Yeah. So very peculiar kind of fish. Yeah, um, yeah. In general, when we're playing against whales like this, one thing that we certainly, there's a few things we really, really need to do. One thing we really need to do is be patient and accept that we're not going to win that many pots against this guy without a hand. That's the first thing. Um, just accept that. He's going to win most of the time when neither of us have anything. And that's totally fine because he's willing to just shovel money in with ace high or bottom pair or whatever. Um, we're okay with that because when we do have a hand, we take all of his money. So we're okay just waiting. It's certainly incorrect for us to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with this kind of fish and try to gain fold equity over this kind of player. It's by far the wrong way but, to go about it. But let me ask you this, Peter. I mean, so you say that he's going to win most of the hands, but mm -hmm. my question on that is... is isn't my range way stronger than his? So I mean, if I if if this guy is raising pre-flop with basically any two, yep. and I have you know a marginal hand, I have Jack Ten suited, a hand that I wouldn't normally think is great uh, from a you know against a uh, early position opener. Right. I think I'm doing pretty good with that hand here against this guy, and and maybe I have a higher expectation to win against this guy versus, you know, a tag. Yeah, you do uh, absolutely. So I mean, I, I'm a little question. I'm questioning what you're saying that I'm I'm going to expect to win less. If my range is stronger, shouldn't yeah. I expect to win more? On right. Let me button. What I said was, 
um, you can expect to win less of the pots where you both don't have anything, where you both flop nothing, right? Okay. Which is different to saying that you're going to win less with Jack-10 suited than you would win against another player. Of course, like, in the long run, you're going to have a higher expectation, and absolutely, you're going to have higher EV with that hand by flatting in position or three-betting in position against the fish than you are against a random player. But what I mean is that we need to be patient in the sense that when you've got Jack-high and, like, nothing going for you post-flop and the fish is shoveling money with Ace-high and isn't going to fold you need to accept that you don't have as much fold equity against this type of player in general than you do against someone else, like a normal, regular, or even a weaker, even a more standard fish, um, a net, whatever. You have way more fold but, equity against those guys than you do against this guy, despite the fact that his range is weaker. But yeah, you will make more in the long run, and your hand will be stronger in okay. the long run because gotcha. the weak stuff you flop will do better because his but, range is so weak. Yeah, but if I do have any value hand, like even yes. second pair here right. or third pair goes way up in value right. versus... You know, uh, a standard, even a standard fish. Yeah, standard fish and certainly a kamikaze whale. When you have second or third pair, absolutely. If he's the kind of guy that just shoves, shovels money in with any two cards, then that pair is ahead of his range. And yeah, you should be looking to try and get the showdown there a lot of the time against these kind of players, depending on exactly how crazy they are. Yeah, um, okay. it's not a golden rule that you should always stack off third pair, but generally speaking, if someone's got a range of any two cards for potting the flop turn and river, you know, a pair is in pretty good shape. So absolutely, when you flop a pair. That, that was going to be my second point. So my first point is being more patient when you have air, when you have absolutely nothing, when you have just air. Um, or you have a very, very weak pair, or you have like a hand that is not good enough for you to choose that spot as one that you want to put lots of money into the pot with. You have to be patient. You have to accept that um, we shouldn't be trying to make this guy fold. We shouldn't be bluffing. We shouldn't be trying to get value by using fold equity at all. We can't generate fold equity, so we shouldn't really try it. We should just go for raw pot equity and have lots of that instead when we put money into the pot and not try and make fold equity. So the first thing is be patient, for sure. Um, the second point, actually, that you sort of alluded to there that I was going to get onto was that marginal hands go way up in value. Hand strength against this kind of player, top, having top pair is a phenomenal hand. Having top pair decent kicker is a hand that you can often be seeking to get your stack in with on the flop against such a player a lot of the time, or at least by the river. Whereas, you know, if you flop top pair, decent kicker, 100 big blinds deep against some tag, you know, you're not going to be as default looking to stack off with that hand, right? So there's a big yeah. difference there. Well, you've got to be more patient with your air, the times we do flop stuff against this kind of villain specifically, our big hands are going to go way up in value. Or not even our big hands, but our marginal mediocre showdown value hands. Showdown value is absolutely huge against an opponent who frequently has zero showdown value when money goes into the pot. So those are the two things I would say first that we should look to adjust. What else do we want to do here? Do we want like regulars to be playing with this guy? Do we want to be in multi-way pots? Or do I we definitely want... want to isolate this guy. Good. We want this guy to ourselves. With any hand, yeah. That's point number three. We want this guy to ourselves a lot of the time. This guy min opens. Say he's like min opening like 74% of hands or even 3xing. What are we going to do with most of our range that we choose to play there? A three bet. We're going to three bet. We're going to isolate him. There are a lot of good reasons to 3-bet. One is for straight value. Get more big hands, big pots. Get more money into the pot against this guy so that you know we're going to be a favor over him. When we flop something, it's going to be a hand that we can play for stacks most of the time. Get money into the pot and stack him. Um, but secondly, get him to ourselves. Let's not allow Jack the Whacker and Two Bucks and Winter is Coming and Wint New York City to come along here and also have a shot to stack this guy. Let's not let them get into the pot for cheap. Let's seize the initiative, isolate the guy, particularly in position, give ourselves the chance to be heads up with him and capitalize on his mistakes fully without letting our opponents do that as well. We want his money. We don't want them to have it. So, absolutely. So that's three things so far. Being patient when we have air and waiting for a spot where we actually have a decent hand strength or a hand strength that's got showdown value at least, depending on the fish. Secondly, um, what was number two? Yeah, our marginal, hands, our marginal hands go way up in value. All right. Yeah, yeah. Um, and number three, we want to isolate this guy a lot. We want to yeah. come into the pot for three bet a lot of the times, isolate the guy and make sure that we get to play pots with the whale. Um, we don't necessarily want to isolate huge preflop when we don't have a huge hand. Uh, the reason for that is that we do have to be fit or fold when we totally brick because we have like zero fold equity oftentimes. So if we've got a hand like Jack-9 suited, yeah, we want to isolate with that hand for sure because it's good enough. But we probably don't want to make it like 3.5x. We probably just want to make it small. We know he's calling anyway preflop. We want to just get him to ourselves. Let's make it small. We can still stack him if we get there. And we can get away from the hand pretty cheap if we don't. And that's the same kind of principle as we've been talking about throughout this series. Where you have no fold equity 
i.e. you've gone past the flop, the fish is calling, doesn't look like he's folding on the board, and you've got a flush draw, be inclined to slow down instead of going for, for fold equity. The fish is raising you, be inclined to just call and only put money into the pot when you've made your hand. Playing against this guy post-flop won't really be any different. We're looking to keep the pot relatively small but isolate and pre-flop, but then put lots of money into the pot when we actually have a hand and get away fairly cheaply when we have air because we know we can't make him fold. That should be our rough game plan. Okay. All right, so that's three important things. This kind of player can be really annoying to play against when you are card dead or when you are out of position. Have you ever been in a spot, Joe, where you've had a maniac to your left who just seems to always have the nuts and you can't make a hand to save your life? Uh, that's the time to get up and move tables, right? <laughs> that's the time to be patient as hell. Okay. Um, if you can hold it together enough to be. Um, just deep breaths, fold, and wait your spots are going to come. Just remember that you don't need to win every hand against this guy. In fact, he'll win the majority of the hands where you both have nothing, but you'll make 10 times that amount of money when you both have something. Well, what, what, what I've seen, you know, even in live play, mm -hmm. is when I have the, the whale to my left, mm -hmm. that if there's any decent regs in the game, they're going to be isolating him before I can even before it comes around to me. Yeah. So it's going to be a very rare opportunity that I get. I mean, so not only do I have to wait for a hand, but I have to wait for a hand where nobody else is isolated and my hand has to be really good to squeeze in, in, in that or, or to four bet in that situation. So it, it's doubly tough when you have the guy to your left because mm -hmm. you have other players mm -hmm. gunning for this guy and, and just waiting. Um, Definitely. And in this situation, you know, he's on my right, so uh, yeah. it's, it's an ideal situation. He's two to your right. It's better if he's one to yeah. your right for sure, but yeah, that's still good. Yeah, you're right. I mean, that's a, I hadn't actually thought of that. That's a good point that other reg, other aware regs will be isolating him before it gets to you and seizing that initiative, and therefore you're not going to get into as many pots with him. That's something that's going to happen. So yeah, if you can hop seats and get to his immediate left, that's amazing. And it's, I don't think it's that unethical. It's just exploiting another one of the edges that poker's offering you, right? It's not against the T's and C's of the card room. You can do that. Right. Um, so I definitely think that's well within your rights to try and get the best position on a fish that you can. Um, it's not that it's negative EV when he's to your, when he's to your left, um, but it's better when he's to your right, for sure. Much better. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So position's a big thing there as well, if you can get it. And what to do about that situation where the regs are kind of um, playing aware and isolating them. See, if it's a limping fish and the regs are sort of isolating really wide, you can look to really 3-bet a nice linear range. Like if this limping fish is cold calling a lot, you can look to 3-bet big hands um, and expand your value range. You can look to 3-bet a lot of stuff and really put pressure on those regs for isolating wide. Um, that's definitely an option. This is different though, isn't it? Because this guy is raising a lot. He's not limping a lot. He's raising a lot. Right. So then the regs are three betting a lot if they're aware. You'll probably find the regs in this game um, aren't really good enough to be isolated three betting them as much as they should be. But nevertheless, but they might this be. winter is coming is 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 good, and I think he right. jumped in there. He 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 saw this and jumped in there. So he's the only one decent at this. Uh, okay, good to know. Cool. Um. So. So yeah, I mean, if they if he's opening and then they're three betting him to isolate before it gets to you, for instance, if you're in that situation, then. You can still look to cold call decent hands to their three bets. Um, if you have big premium stuff, you can look to four bet for sure. Um, but you can look to cold call hands like you have just now, like the Ace Queen of Hearts. You're not going to go away if someone three bets, three bet ISOs the fish for this hand. You're absolutely right. going to see a flop because when you flop top pair, you just gen the stack most of the time. There's a bit more reverse implied odds against the other reg, but he, if they're aware, they should have a wide range too. So the wider the range that they're ISO three betting with, the wider range you can afford to call cold call with and get into pots. It's not ideal because you don't get the fish to yourself, but you can still play hands, basically. You can be looser than you would normally against their three bets from a cold it, spot. It, it, in that example, it's better to uh, just cold call versus uh, four bet there. Like, if, if I know winter is coming, mm -hmm. is going is isolating this guy, and I have ace-queen here, I don't even know in his hand what happens. Mm -hmm. I don't remember. Um, wouldn't I um, four bet there versus uh, flatting with the ace-queen? Or which, which would be the default? I would usually flat because when you 4-bet, you're going to start blowing the whale out of the pot lots of the time. Um, although he's a whale and he's quite likely to call the 3-bet, he's much less likely to just cold call a 4-bet. I mean, if he's so bad that he's cold, cold calling a 4-bet with any two cards, then absolutely you should 4-bet. Um, but I think most of the time you'll be blowing out a lot of his dominated stuff. You want to see a flop with this whale, that's your number one target. So... By cold calling, you allow the whale to come along as well, which he will most of the time. When you 4-bet, you start to blow him out. And also, remember that we want to make a hand against this guy. 
we don't have a hand yet, we just have an ace and a queen. Um, we want to make a hand because our fold equity post-flop will be very limited, and so we don't want to invest loads of money pre-flop without a made hand. Um, if we have like aces or kings, it can be different, but we don't want to invest like 25 big blinds before the flop here, because when we miss, we're going to have a very t hard time winning the pot and be burning some money. So it's probably best to cold call a lot of our range in that situation to A, keep the whale in, and B, not be putting loads of money into the pot before we've got a hand that we can you know, continue with post-flop. Okay. Got it. But when you 3-bet, you're putting in less money pre-flop, so that's okay. You know, you can isolate the whale with a little small 3-bet, because your purpose is isolation. And there's still loads of money left behind for you to win, and you're, when you do miss and have to fold, because the whale goes berserk with bottom pair, you know, you can get away with away from the pot pretty cheap. So, our pr general principle here is isolate, play as many pots as we can get away with against him, and put money into the pot when we've got our showdown value slash decent hands and otherwise look to not do anything stupid basically that should be our game plan okay we don't need to spew let's let him spew let's just make hands and stack them i, I should have i should have heard this lecture before this session <laughs> <laughs> if only you could go back and say me eh? yeah. well, i know next time i mean i don't i don't think i played terribly but we'll see I'm yeah well it's good to say give a sort of rundown of what our general strategy should be and now that we've done that you can sort of look at this and this is I've, we could easily do a coaching session of this format couldn't we where we like pick a topic like playing against really aggro fish, and then we do a little intro to it, and then we go into a video and see what you should have done. We get the student to review their own stuff because that's often a lot better. Self critique is much better than me just, you know, rambling on at you. That's not that's what you get in videos. That's not why you pay for coaching, right? So mm -hmm. that's a good format. Um, so let's do it now. We've done our little intro. We know what to look for. So now you've got the tools to assess your own game. I'm going to let you go and do it, and I'm going to jump in as usual with some criticism of that and to add extra stuff and all of that. So why don't we roll it and we'll see what spots we can get into with this guy. Wow, so not only is he opening really wide, but he's 8xing. Love the 3-bet. Um, definitely a spot to 3-bet. If he's absolutely insane and has, has no folding range here, shoving is not like out of the question, although it seems drastic. But it depends. You need a pretty good read for that. You need to know the guy is just never folding anything. But if that's the case, shipping is pretty nice. So then the sizing here is okay. It's not too big. It's definitely not. Um, well, I mean, we do only have ace-queen. We do have a really strong hand, though. Um, like, when we make it this size... Okay, here's the thing. Um, our hand is, like, super strong here. Like, ace-queen suited is, like, really quite nothing against his range. It's okay to build the pot a bit more in this case. But, yeah, I do think it's a bit big. Um, we will get it in pre if he shoves, obviously, because he's crazy and we have ace-queen suited. But, um... We can probably make this like eight or nine, and then if he like goes berserk post flop, and we can we get a texture that we can't continue on, we can follow them. We can still stack them on favorable textures. So yeah, I do prefer going a bit smaller here. Okay. For the reasons that smaller we talked about before. or jamming. I don't like. I I like jamming. It's quite cool, but I prefer not to jam unless we've got a read that he's on mad tilt and it's just going to call off like queen nine off or something like that. If we know he's just wanting to get a stack in at any cost, jam. Otherwise, just make a small ISO 3-bet um, here, basically. Okay. And that's got the incentive that you can jam over you and you can still get it in pre-flop in good shape as well, which is nice, of course. That's better than flatting because, you know, we still have this option to get it all in pre as well, which is pretty good because we are going to be miles ahead. Okay, so we get Jin. We check the flop, yeah? Yeah. Love it. Um, this takes us to our next part of what we're going to do post-flop. We do not need three streets to get our stack in here, do we, Joe? We don't need to build. Sometimes no. in poker we need to build. This is not one of those times. This is a time when there's lots of money in the pot already. How do we get him to put money in with the widest range when there's lots of money in the pot already? We check. What if he's got 6-4 suited? Is he going to continue if we see that? No, probably not. But, well, he might because he's, if he's absolutely diabolical, he might shove or something. But most likely he's going to fold trash here. But what's this crazy guy going to do with trash when we check back? Most likely. He's probably going to bet. He's going to be stupid, right? I, I've seen this guy, just as a little bit of background. Not, I, don't, I obviously don't have a ton of hands on him, but I've seen him sort of raise a lot pre-flop, check, or, or if he doesn't have anything on flop and turn, and then just, and just fire the river really big. I've seen him do this in a, in a few hands before this with other players. And, uh, and of course, I don't get to see his showdown on it because most of the time they're folding. Mm -hmm. So um, 
I, I see that's part of his his plan. If uh, so, I, I'm plan, hoping yeah. that I can get him to to throw in a big bet on the river here. Okay. Let's and then yeah, let's still bet the turn though because yeah. there's just so much shit that won't fold now as well if we bet small enough. We don't need to bet too big here. We just need to bet kind of small so it allows us to shove the river for not an over bet if he does. Like if he just keeps checking down with a jack here, um, that's kind of a disaster if we've not built the pot yet. Yeah, this is too big. There's just no need to bet this big. Um, okay. You want to continue your strategy of rope-a-dope here. You want to continue to leave his... You're definitely stacking off. You have the effective nuts. Like we say, marginal hands go up in value. Ace-queen here isn't even that marginal in a three-bet pot to begin with, but against this guy, it's like the nuts. Basically. So, like half pot, 15 or something? 15 is too big. Let's go like 12. Oh, really? I mean, there's only like 40 left behind. If we go 12 there, there's already going to be like 50 in the river with 30 behind. We've got ample room to just bet small, rope a dope, induce as much action as we can from his bluffs, make him call with just like a pair of threes, make him call with just like eight, seven off and be making a big mistake, something like that. Um, let's bet smaller. And then okay. shove, we can still shove the river. We don't need to build. We don't even need to protect our hand that much here. Yeah, he'll have like a random king sometimes, but or he'll have like a random gut shot. But it's we have so much equity against that. It's not really a big deal. We're getting the money in anyway. So yeah, your turn bet's too big. But other than that, it's good. Okay. And your three bet's too big as well. Preflop is no need to go that big. I mean, I don't actually hate your 3-bet size, it's just because when you get that much money in the pot against this guy with a hand that's way ahead of him, it's generally good for you. We do take a bit more variance that way, and it's probably slightly more plus EV to go smaller, just because then you can still stack him when things go well and then lose less when things go badly. More often than not, things will go well, but you can still stack him. Like, here, just raise. Like, there's no need to limp here, because unless you think he's raising any two cards from yeah. the small See, blind. I normally never limp this hand mm. I only did that because of this guy to try to see him you know the if problem he's gonna is that this is the spot that he's most likely to complete and that he's most likely not to raise in pre-flop the reason is that he's getting a really really cheap price just to see a flop with his random crap like it's not that he's going to raise a hundred percent here he'll raise a bunch of stuff but there's a lot of stuff that he's just going to limp with but he's probably like never folding the small blind if you open that's the thing. So you fail to ISO him here sometimes because he won't always raise the small blind. He might like half the time, but then that's half the time when, you know... I mean, I see what you're trying to do. I mean, the guy is raising 73% of the time pre-flop. So, yeah, he is raising 73%. And he sees a couple limps. I think that's, for him, in my mind, I'm thinking that's the perfect opportunity for this guy, mm. uh, you know, to uh, to get some dead money. I disagree. I think that most fish are going to complete here wider than they would limp other positions i think because their price is so good and they're in a small blind and they just hit complete i think he completes here more often than he would open raise and more often than he would ever limp in another position basically by quite a okay. quite a way um that said there's a there is merit to this in that if he does raise you can get in a three bet and just get the pot really big straight away and isolate him that way and get lots of money in the pot with a good hand that's definitely good as well right. um so all in all, what's better? It depends on how likely he is here to raise. And if you've got a read that he is going to raise here a lot, so you think that's the case, I like this. But if he's likely to complete here, which I would assume if I hadn't seen the... I mean, you know more about this guy than I do, but if I hadn't seen him play much yet and I just saw that last time we played and I'd just seen his stats, I'd always just raise there. I'd always just open just to okay. make sure that I get him to myself. And I'd open like two and a half. I'd open like 5x as well. I'd open big just to make sure. Five X, oh, okay. Yeah, definitely. That's one thing you should be doing is making your opens when you've got big hands from early position bigger to A, get more money in the pot with those good hands in position and B, to drive out other regulars and isolate the guy. So he men, he men raises here, which is ideal. Now you hit the three, but, three bet button. That's imperative. Bigger, bigger, bigger. Now they're all just going to call when you make it that size. This is the problem. That was too small. Yep. Go bigger because here, in the last situation, it was just you and the fish, right? You didn't need to worry about isolating. Um, so you could afford to go small because no one is going to come along for like a cold 18 big blinds anyway, right? If you only made it nine last time. No one's just going to cold call 18 big blinds. But here, um, people already have some money in the pot. 
especially like winter is coming, he's already got a dollar in there, he's almost always calling this because you're deep, he's deep with the fish, he's never going away, you're guaranteed to see a three-way flop here basically unless he's so, bad. Talking um, about seven, eight dollars here? Yeah, it'd go about six or seven bucks probably, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. The other three might yeah. cold call this as well, especially the guy in the button because everyone's deep with each other. That's the thing as well. They're all deep. They've all got these implied odds. You've got to go bigger. You've got to go like seven here at least, yeah. Get okay, this guy to yourself. i got to get that down because my yeah. sizing of these three bets is way off. Yeah. Norm, my default is to go three times what he's betting and then I add in yeah. what the other people have thrown in the pot. So in this case, it would be $3 and I'm adding a dollar in for winter's coming, $4. Yep. So four fifty five. that would be the default. But because of – if this guy wasn't this crazy whale, would this be a correct – uh, yeah. sizing here or is it only because of yeah this is a very unique situation that's why this is different here okay that's unique for two reasons one everyone is mining against harley 06 everyone's trying to connect with that flop and get that money right so they're willing to pay a lot more pre-flop to see that flop because the reward is so much greater when they do secondly they're all deep with each other so when they do flop well that's more implied odds more reason to put in more money pre-flop they're deep and they're hunting a whale they're going to pay a lot more to see flops therefore and they're going to do that profitably and correctly. Therefore, you need to make it bigger to make it then incorrect and therefore make, make it so that you get Harley 06 to yourself. Okay, basically. got it. Very unique situation. Normally, the sizing, if you were just squeezing here, say like Harley was a reg and he opened and winter's coming flat, yeah, you want to go like 4.5, five times, something like that. But now we've got this. I'm really, the fact that winter is coming folded there, I mean, I don't think he can be that great a player, in all honesty, when he's deep with a lot of the other guys at the table and Harley's there and he's got position on Harley like he shouldn't have a folding range to that size the fact he does is you okay. know, I think it's a mistake regardless of what he has I don't think he's wonderful but he's just no. better than the rest of the fish yeah right fair <laughs> fair okay so we the reason that we really want to get Harley 06 to ourselves is as well is that we don't want to have to make a set to stack him we just want an over pair we just want the flop to come like 10-3 deuce and we're probably good. We want the flop to come like 6-5 deuce. Anything like that. Any kind of low-ish board. And we're happy. Even on like Queen XX, Jack XX, we can still pot control and catch his bluffs and make a bunch of money too. But when we let other people into the pot, suddenly one pair of nines is bad on loads of textures and is not good enough for us to continue with. That's yeah. why it sucks not to isolate here. Okay. We, we make it so that we need a better absolute hand strength to do anything post-flop. So yeah, I agree with checking this flop. I mean, Harley's never going to fold a better hand. Two bucks could have a better hand. Why spew into this giant pot with just a pair of nines? I keep checking now as well, absolutely. You do not want to bluff here. You can't value bet here. There's no reason to bet. And the same goes on the river. Um, he bets half pot here. The problem with calling here is that, you, okay, two bucks probably never has an ace. This is not a terrible call. Um... By calling here, you also probably stop two bucks from calling with a ten, which is good. Um, you need to have twenty five percent equity against Harley. You can probably have that. This is kind of close. I mean, two bucks will probably still call if he has like a jack. Probably, maybe not. Yeah, I don't mind this call if you do make it, just because okay. Harley can have anything, and two bucks probably has to play quite tight when it gets round to him. So yeah, I think that's a pretty. Pretty sophisticated call you just made there, sir. Thank you. Uh, I, I, as you said earlier, I, I probably did it by sheer uh, luck and not genius. <laughs> <laughs> it looks good anyway. I mean, I, I do think it's marginal, but I like it just because Harley's range is practically anything. Um, you only need 25% equity against that range. You're going to have like 50% equity against Harley there. Um, yeah, he'll have a random 10 sometimes. Sometimes he'll have River of King Queen, sure. But so much, so often he'll just have like seven nine ace three no not ace three that's the nuts king three you know like queen nine random crap basically okay. um and two bucks has defined his range as pretty weak that's important two bucks his range is mostly stuff like pocket sevens maybe like four five six seven eight nine pocket eights pocket deuces this kind of thing when he doesn't Fl get flop flush him. draw Maybe, maybe not. I mean, probably not most of the time because he's not putting any money into the pot. He could have a flush draw that missed, sure. Um, but most of the time he doesn't have 
a jack or better, basically, most of the okay. time, which is what you need. Your call is might even discourage him from calling a hand like Queen Jack here. It's possible that he folds that after you call. Um, yeah, I was really, I thought about this. I, I was really afraid of uh, two bucks on this. Uh, so, I mean, clearly if two bucks is not in there, this is an easy call, correct? Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. It's a snap call. Yeah. Um, all right, so. But it's still a good call because your call can actually dissuade him from calling with 10x or jack x, which is really cool. Okay, all right. I think he folds a 10 on that river pretty comfortably most of the time, which is why calling with nines is just pretty sweet. It's marginal. Don't don't get me wrong. It's not massively plus EV. You're not going to beat Harley more than like forty five percent of the time there. But you're going to beat him enough for that price that you've got to call F two bucks okay. calls most of the time, which he should do. So yeah. So here with the ten nine, um, we're in the big blind, right? We don't need to isolate because no one else is coming along. So we don't want to fold this hand for this price. So we call, right? I'm just giving <laughs> you the answers on a plate here. Should be letting you do this. Okay. <laughs> So we, there's no longer the need to good. There's no longer a need to isolate. We don't need to three bet. We want to keep the pot small with a weak hand until we've made something big. Minor implied odds. We do not want to blow the pot with the ten nine offset because our fold equity is niente. We pots that we fold. We wait for another spot. We don't get out of line with ten high as per our plan. Good stuff. Okay. It's a very interesting concept. This video actually. I'm going to check in with you again, Joe. We're going to do another video in the future and sort of like months down the line and see what's going on then. Okay. See what stakes you're crushing. I'll be a, I'll be a baller then. Baller. No doubt you'll be like an instructor on some baller <laughs> site and you'll be too good to do videos for characters anymore. They grew up so fast. A shame he's not on all of our tables. He's yeah, just like yeah. dominating the action everywhere. Like, this is the kind of guy that tilts Phil Helmuth. <laughs> okay, so Liz so, is uh... Jack Nine. Ooh, for AX. I mean. That's, yes. This is questionable here for me. This, this is, is marginal. Like... Yes, his range is wide. If he made this like small, and we could, we had the option of keeping the pot smaller and isolating him in a small pot pre-flop, we should probably ISO, just because we have position against the fish with two cards that can flop top pair and can make straights. But we do not have that option. To flat here is probably too marginal for this price, putting in eight big blinds. That's probably too much. Um, and... Three betting here doesn't really make sense because the pot's going to be massive, and we've got we don't want to build massive pots with bad hands, right? We want to build massive pots with good hands and isolate in a huge pot with a good hand. We don't want to three bet isolate in a huge pot with a bad hand. So yeah, I think for AX we kind of have to be a bit more uh, strict with our selection criteria than Jack Nine off. So I go for a fold here. Okay, well, good on me, Joe. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Give yourself king queen instead, then you probably want to call or min click it back or something like that. The thing is, when he makes it eight x as well, and you don't have a monstrous hand, you don't really need to isolate because the eight x is like going to isolate in itself. It's so big that regs aren't going to come along for eight x. You know, like he's right. already doing that for you. You don't need to isolate every hand you play against an eight x open like you would if he made it small because you're not okay. going to get multi weight pots there. So it's not so important. But when you have a big hand, then you want a three bet, sure. Okay. Like with the ace queen, you want a three bet that, but you don't want a three bet like all the hands you're playing there. Not necessarily. This ten nine hand, I don't even, ten sign, I don't even know what happened. We could go back and check. Yeah. I'm I uh I folded that hand. I don't know if that was a good fold or not. Well let's have a look. We open hijack, we get called by a cut off fish. Shame we couldn't have the tens on the first table instead. Yeah. We get king at seven three against this random forty six eleven player. Uh, yeah, just bet like half pot, sure. Protect your hand, take it down a bunch. He calls. You have tens. Yeah. You have a nice draw now. Um, 
See, I don't know. Does that help my hand or hurt it more? That 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 diamond there. See, I don't. Um, yeah, I, I'm I'm one to a flush, but I, I don't know here. I mean, yeah, I mean, I take your point. It's not a great draw. Um, your opponent can make a flush on this card sometimes. I would check fold this turn just because if a passive fish bets this turn, you're looking at top pair or better, and your ten high flush draw is not really all that. On this river, though, I mean, he's checked back the turn. He could have a king in his range. But a lot of the time he's going to have 7x, he's going to have a random pocket pair. I would bet this river small for value, honestly. Um, for one, I'd call this as well. I think you're just getting too good right. a price. Okay. Um, you only need to be good 25% of the time. Yeah, he can have king x. He probably doesn't have the nuts or a flush when he checks the turn. Um, and you only need him to have some random crap, like 4, 5, 5, 6, random queen, jack of spades. You know, 7x that's betting for the sake of it fours that's betting for the sake of it all that, all that all that stuff only needs to happen a quarter of the time for you to break even on a call and it's a random fish so probably call river but okay you can bet river yourself once he checks turn that's probably better because passive guys are not likely not so likely to bluff they're more likely just to call really wide so if you bet like two bucks in the river just get him to call with all this but, but i should have bet full turn and uh, no no i like i like check folding turn i think the turn's quite a bad card and oh, if he bets okay. the turn then then his range is quite strong you i got but once turn checks through and you still have a pair of tens, you get the nice board pairing river. It's good for you. Uh, makes it less likely as like a set of threes or anything like that. Then you should probably just go ahead and bet small, get value from the middling pairs in his range, and protect yourself from having to sort of check fold to a bigger bet. You don't really love that so much, although it's okay. Um, yeah, little blocker bet for value on that river is kind of ideal there, I think. Okay. And as played, you probably have to call for that price but not like fist pump or anything because he is passive. So again, this guy is just, he, he just bombs the river mm -hmm. and uh, most people are folding to him. Yes. That's what I've seen him do over and over again. Cool, so we just need to get a hand on the river. It's not to say we shouldn't always build a pot before then though because he should still have a really wide range of getting to the river too. Um, it just means we want to give him a bit more rope when we get to the river. Maybe throw in some river checks where we wouldn't normally or something like that. So look at his aggression here. Mm -hmm. This is when he's, it doubles on the river, his, his river yeah. aggression here. He's aggressive uh, pre-flop and then on the river it just doubles. Yeah. Um, Make your race 4x in that spot. You're going to take it down more often pre-flop, which is good. And if you see a flop, you're going to win more money with your C-bets are going to work a lot. Like, you just have so much fold equity. Pre-flop on the flop, make it bigger. Make more money. Get that okay. money. That's my new saying, get that money. I think I heard someone else say it once, and <laughs> it's like my saying. Sorry, whoever I ripped it off from. I gave a student a goal the other day that was literally get that money. That was one of his goals. And it meant it meant um, don't value bet really small in case they fold when you can value bet big and just win all their money. Which is an important thing against fish. Okay. So this this is this I'm not sure what happens in this hand, but this guy uh, was owning me a little bit here, you know, I, I uh, blind versus blind, I raise, he calls. This guy was pretty much calling off any raises uh, pre-flop. I forget what happened in this hand, but I know yeah. he was frustrating me, this guy. Let's bet the flop anyway for value slash taking it down. Um, let's check the turn. We don't really have a choice but to check fold here. He seems stationary. I mean, yeah, I mean, he pots the turn. Like, we just can't do anything here. I know we have a side. It's frustrating, but we kind of just have to wait till we have a hand. This guy doesn't like the fold, okay. obviously. Makes me more happy about my call in the last hand that I wanted to make, though, just the fact that he seems kind of Station okay. and spewy. Right. Just think he can have a lot of shit in the river. Um, yeah. Um, this is a kind of interesting spot. I don't hate a limp here, no. I don't mind. Yeah. This is. Uh, I don't want to fold it. I don't want to raise it. I'm kind of. Yeah, I like. I like, a, I like a call. I mean, you have absolute position. You're going to see a four way pot um, with a hand that plays well against fish when you get a good price to flop big. And if you raise, you're going to get called in two spots, have very little fold equity with six high. I think this is a good example of you picking up, you remembering our sort of, my preachings last time about um, 
when we want to inflate pots, when we think we'll have fold equity and get heads up, and then those other times where we're not going to get heads up or have fold equity when we want to keep pots smaller with weak hands. Yeah. So, good. Yeah, before our coaching, I would have definitely uh, raised there. Yeah. It's a spot where if you don't have Largo ahead of you, if you just have that guy with the shark picture, then you want to raise. But when you've got Largo ahead of you, you want to just call because mm -hmm. you're not going to get heads up. Okay. So um, here, you know, I, I'm normally opening with this from yep. mid position. Uh, it's just a question of the sizing against this guy. Um, I don't know if I should be raising my opening bet here, assuming this guy's going to call pretty much anything. Yeah. Uh, that way, I sort of isolate before. You understand what I'm yeah, saying? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, you've I, got. I thought about that later. There's two things here. On um, in favor of making it small, you don't yet have a great hand, and you'd like to see a flop without investing too much money. Um, just because we know this guy is not going to let us win the pot with ace high, most likely. Um, but in favor of making it bigger, we don't want these wrecks to come along. I think if you go about four wrecks here, that's a good happy medium. Okay, four wrecks open shuts out most of the other shuts out the other two guys most of the time, and doesn't inflate the pot beyond the power of your hand because you need to have you need to make hands to play against this guy so you don't want to shove loads of money in the pot before you've got a strong hand basically to break it down in really simple terms so here we've got a gut shot um, I mean I really don't mind just betting here because I think a few things can happen does he raise c-bets? that's one question have you seen him raise c-bets? is it likely? no Okay. I, I, again, I think post flop, but I mean, again, I, I realize this more afterwards because mm -hmm. when I was in it, you know, I'm just, I'm just thinking, you know, get, get the whales money, get the yes. whales. Yeah, that money. I'm, I'm really trying to look for any hand that I have just to get his money before winter is coming gets it yep. because, um, you know, he's he's got better position than I do, and um, but I really think that. Flop and turn. I, um, he was more passive, except for the river. Yeah, then he, he was wasn't crazy. really three betting on uh, you know or, or re raising or yep. or check raising. Uh, flop and flop and turn. Okay, then we uh, bet. If we're not going to get check raised here very much, we bet. If we are going to get check raised here loads, we just check and control the size of the pot and just try and win with ace high. But here okay. we bet because one, we can just protect our hand if he does fold. It's fine. Two. He can call us with king high just because he doesn't like the fold. We can actually get value here. And three, our hand can actually develop into something monstrous and we want money in the pot in case that happens. So bet okay. if you're not going to get raised here for those reasons. All right. We make a pair of threes. Um, he dunks pot. Yeah, let's call. We have like a pair now. We have a backdoor draw. I'd be tempted to call River here as well. I mean, his line doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Okay, let's yeah, let's check back and just win. We could consider a thin value, but I don't really like it though. I think he has too many random five x, pocket six is eight x, that kind of crap. So yeah, let's just check back. Nice answer. All right. wow. Same exact hand. He had king six versus those nines actually. <laughs> yeah, I believe. Yeah, you played that well. That's good. Obviously, not folding to his ridiculous turn dunk. It's just like you have like almost any two cards. I don't care. I have a pair. That's what we're saying. Number two, marginal hands go so much further. A pair of threes is a crappy hand, and that's bought against most people. Against him, right? It's like Which is it coming? I fold instantly there. Yeah, it's like a comfortable bluff catcher against this guy. Use it as such. You've also got a gutter. Your wheel draw would have made you like the anti nuts. Would have made you like the ace high straight. So good thing we didn't make that. See it at six. Mm -hmm. And yeah, we can't defend King Nine. I mean, this time he goes one better. He goes nine point five x instead of eight. Oops, I just made the screen small. Why did I do that? I think I was going to check how long we'd um, been recording. Yeah, that's all I was going to do. Forty-four minutes. Okay, this has been good. Um, I think now we should 
probably wrap up because we're getting to that time of the video. Okay. I'd love to see more of this because it's a really fascinating concept actually how we should play against this guy. It's really fun. I think this has been a good video. Um, but yeah. So that's the end of Whack a Fish for now. Not the end of the fish whacking because Joe's going to continue doing that. Just so we won't <laughs> be watching all the time. Well, I will be because we're still doing coaching, but you guys will will have to go and whack your own fish now instead to get your fix. Anything you want to... How's this series been for you, Joe? Anything you want to say? Uh, um, I, 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 I think that um, it's um, it been very instructive. I, I think that Taylor, I guess you call it in the UK, bespoke <laughs> suits. I mean, you, you've actually... the. I, to look at my specific game, what's going on in New Jersey, and to tailor my game to the specific type of fish mm -hmm. I have has been very beneficial. So I really think that, yeah, watching the videos is really cool, but the fact that you were able to come into my specific game and tailor make it for me and my situation, how the games are playing now, is priceless. So yeah. uh, it's really going to help my, uh, you know, uh, my win rate. Uh, so that's cool. I recommend you guys um, actually get some private coaching if you can afford it. it, it for me, it's, it's definitely paid for itself. So awesome. That's that's the right that's thing it. to say. That's like the thing that you're supposed to say, but I'm not, I'm not allowed to tell you to say. <laughs> that's it's not like a too... big advertisement. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No. No. For sure. I mean, there's a lot of value, obviously, in having structured learning and having like someone to come and actually say, "Look, these are your goals. This is your your. This is how you're going to set about your learning." These are the things you're going to study. These are your biggest leaks. We'll fix these first and come back and we'll fix more. And that way you've got structure. You've got direction. You're not sort of wandering through the forest on your own, not knowing where you're going. Because um, poker is a confusing place. So for sure, um, this kind of thing can be useful, as you've seen us do here with our all our goal setting and sort of tailoring. I mean, Joe's in a very unique situation and that these games that we've been looking at over the past few weeks have been very sort of like a a special little pond of fish in the whole, separate from the rest of the ocean, right? So that's been cool because we've been able to talk about how we should exploit this uber fishy pond. But there are these fish in everyone's games on PokerStars.com and Zoom. These fish pop up everywhere. It's just they're not quite so concentrated. So it's been cool for us to be able to have a little pond where we can focus on exactly just playing against fish because, you know, four out of five opponents is one. And that's pretty unique. So... So yeah, man, we'll check back up with you in a while and see how you're doing and make a, another one-off video and see what you've learned. Because we'll be doing sessions in between, so you'll continue learning in your poker journey. So we'll check back in. All right, you want to sign yourself off? All right, guys, good luck at the tables. Uh, catch some fish, whack some fish. <laughs> whack some fish, get that money. Okay, see you soon, get guys. Money. Good luck.